who were the leaders of abolition. Leaders of the anti-slavery movement included journalist William Lloyd Garrison, 1805-1879. Founder of the influential anti-slavery journal The Liberator and of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Established 1833, Brothers Arthur, 1786-1865, and Lewis, 1788-1873. Tappan. Prominent New York merchants who were also founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and Theodore Dwight Weld. 1803-1895, leader of student protests, organizer of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. And author of the Bible Against Slavery, 1837, and other abolitionist works. Underground Railroad Conductor Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, worked against slavery by helping to free hundreds of blacks who escaped slavery in the South. Heading for Northern States and Canada. Writers such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, 1811-1896, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1851-52. Helped strengthen the abolitionist cause and were instrumental in swaying public sentiment. In the hands of some activists, the movement became violent. In 1859 ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800 to 1859, led a raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry, in present-day West Virginia, which proved a failed attempt to emancipate slaves by force. Who were the leaders of abolition? Leaders of the anti-slavery movement included journalist William Lloyd Garrison, 1805-1879. Founder of the influential anti-slavery journal The Liberator and of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Established 1833, Brothers Arthur, 1786-1865, and Lewis, 1788-1873. Tappan. Prominent New York merchants who were also founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and Theodore Dwight Weld. 1803-1895, leader of student protests, organizer of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. And author of the Bible Against Slavery, 1837, and other abolitionist works. Underground Railroad Conductor Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, worked against slavery by helping to free hundreds of blacks who escaped slavery in the South. Heading for Northern States and Canada. Writers such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, 1811-1896, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1851-52. Helped strengthen the abolitionist cause and were instrumental in swaying public sentiment. In the hands of some activists, the movement became violent. In 1859 ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800 to 1859, led a raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry, in present-day West Virginia, which proved a failed attempt to emancipate slaves by force.
who started the Underground Railroad. American abolitionist, lecturer, and nurse Harriet Tubman, c. 1820 to 1913, set up the network to emancipate slaves. Tubman was motivated to do so after she had made her way to freedom in 1849, and then wished the same for her family. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. For the next ten years Tubman acted as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Making at least 15 trips into southern slave states. And guiding not only her parents and siblings, but more than 300 slaves to freedom in the north. She was called the Moses of her people for her emancipation efforts. The journeys to freedom were demanding and often dangerous missions. Though Tubman was small in stature, she possessed extraordinary leadership qualities. Author, clergyman, and army officer Thomas Wentworth Higginson. 1823-1911, called her the greatest heroine of the age. Who started the Underground Railroad? American abolitionist, lecturer, and nurse Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, set up the network to emancipate slaves. Tubman was motivated to do so after she had made her way to freedom in 1849, and then wished the same for her family. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. For the next ten years Tubman acted as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Making at least 15 trips into southern slave states. And guiding not only her parents and siblings, but more than 300 slaves to freedom in the north. She was called the Moses of her people for her emancipation efforts. The journeys to freedom were demanding and often dangerous missions. Though Tubman was small in stature, she possessed extraordinary leadership qualities. Author, clergyman, and army officer Thomas Wentworth Higginson. 1823 to 1911 called her the greatest heroine of the age. What did the founding of Liberia have to do with the anti-slavery movement? With the goal of transporting freed slaves back to their homeland. Members of the American Colonization Society, organized 1816-17. Made land purchases on the West African coast. The holdings were named Liberia, a Latin word meaning freedom. The first black Americans arrived there in 1822. But the society's plan was controversial. Even some abolitionists and blacks opposed it. As they believed the only answer to the question of slavery was to eradicate it from the United States and extend the full rights of citizenship to the freed slaves in their new American home. Nevertheless, 
By 1860 11,000 freed black slaves from the United States had been settled there. Eventually a total of 15,000 made the transatlantic voyage to a secured freedom in Liberia. The country was established as an independent republic on July 26, 1847. What did the founding of Liberia have to do with the anti-slavery movement? With the goal of transporting freed slaves back to their homeland. Members of the American Colonization Society, organized 1816-17. Made land purchases on the West African coast. The holdings were named Liberia, a Latin word meaning freedom. The first black Americans arrived there in 1822. But the society's plan was controversial. Even some abolitionists and blacks opposed it. As they believed the only answer to the question of slavery was to eradicate it from the United States and extend the full rights of citizenship to the freed slaves in their new American home. Nevertheless, by 1860 11,000 freed black slaves from the United States had been settled there. Eventually a total of 15,000 made the transatlantic voyage to a secured freedom in Liberia. The country was established as an independent republic on July 26, 1847. What did lawmakers do to resolve the slavery question before the Civil War? The mid-1800s were a trying time for the nation the divide widened between the northern free states and the southern slave states, which were growing increasingly dependent on agricultural slave labor. Government tried but was unable to bring resolution to the conflict over slavery. Instead, its efforts seemed geared toward maintaining the delicate north-south political balance in the nation. After the Mexican War, 1846-48, the issue was front and center as congressman. Considered whether slavery should be extended into Texas and the Western Territories. Gained in the Peace Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which officially ended the war. Lawmakers arrived at the Compromise of 1850, which proved a poor attempt to assuage mounting tensions. The legislation allowed for Texas to be admitted to the Union as a slave state. California to be admitted as a free state, slavery was prohibited, voters in New Mexico and Utah to decide the slavery question themselves. A method called popular sovereignty, the slave trade to be prohibited in Washington, D.C., and for passage of a strict fugitive slave law to be enforced nationally. Four years later, as it considered how to admit Kansas and Nebraska to the Union, Congress reversed an earlier decision, part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that had declared the territories north of the Louisiana Purchase to be free, and set up a dangerous situation in the new states. The slavery status of Kansas and Nebraska would be decided by popular sovereignty, the voters in each state. Nebraska was settled mostly by people opposing slavery, but settlers from both the north and the south poured into Kansas. 
which became the setting for violent conflicts between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. Both sides became determined to swing the vote by sending squatters to settle the land. Conflicts resulted, with most of them clustered around the Kansas border with Missouri. Where slavery was legal. In one incident, on May 24, 1856, ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800-1859, led a massacre in which five pro-slavery men were brutally murdered as they slept. The act had been carried out in retribution for earlier killings of freemen at Lawrence. Kansas, Brown claimed his was a mission of God. Newspapers dubbed the series of deadly conflicts, which eventually claimed more than 50 lives, bleeding Kansas. The situation proved that neither congressional compromises nor the doctrine of popular sovereignty would solve the nation's deep ideological differences. What did lawmakers do to resolve the slavery question before the Civil War? The mid-1800s were a trying time for the nation the divide widened between the northern free states and the southern slave states, which were growing increasingly dependent on agricultural slave labor. Government tried but was unable to bring resolution to the conflict over slavery. Instead, its efforts seemed geared toward maintaining the delicate north-south political balance in the nation. After the Mexican War, 1846-48, the issue was front and center as congressman. Considered whether slavery should be extended into Texas and the Western Territories. Gained in the Peace Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which officially ended the war. Lawmakers arrived at the Compromise of 1850, which proved a poor attempt to assuage mounting tensions. The legislation allowed for Texas to be admitted to the Union as a slave state. California to be admitted as a free state, slavery was prohibited, voters in New Mexico and Utah to decide the slavery question themselves. A method called popular sovereignty, the slave trade to be prohibited in Washington, D.C., and for passage of a strict fugitive slave law to be enforced nationally. Four years later, as it considered how to admit Kansas and Nebraska to the Union. Congress reversed an earlier decision, part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820, that had declared the territories north of the Louisiana Purchase to be free, and set up a dangerous situation in the new states. The slavery status of Kansas and Nebraska would be decided by popular sovereignty, the voters in each state. Nebraska was settled mostly by people opposing slavery, but settlers from both the North and the South poured into Kansas, which became the setting for violent conflicts between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. Both sides became determined to swing the vote by sending squatters to settle the land. Conflicts resulted, with most of them clustered around the Kansas border with Missouri, where slavery was legal. In one incident, on May 24, 1856, ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800-1859,
led a massacre in which five pro-slavery men were brutally murdered as they slept. The act had been carried out in retribution for earlier killings of freemen at Lawrence. Kansas, Brown claimed his was a mission of God. Newspapers dubbed the series of deadly conflicts, which eventually claimed more than 50 lives, bleeding Kansas. The situation proved that neither congressional compromises nor the doctrine of popular sovereignty would solve the nation's deep ideological differences. Why did President Lincoln issue the Emancipation Proclamation before the end of the Civil War? As the war raged between the Confederacy and the Union, it looked like victory would be a long time in the making. In the summer of 1862 things seemed grim for the Federal troops when they were defeated at the Second Battle of Bull Run, which took place in northeastern Virginia on August 29-30. But on September 17, with the Battle of Antietam, in Maryland, the Union finally forced the Confederates to withdraw across the Potomac into Virginia. That September day was the bloodiest of the war. President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, decided that this withdrawal was success enough for him to make his proclamation. And on September 22, he called a cabinet meeting. That day he presented to his advisors the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The official Emancipation Proclamation was issued later. On January 1, 1863. This final version differed from the preliminary one in that it specified emancipation was to be effected only in those states that were in rebellion, i.e. the South. This key change had been made because the President's proclamation was based on congressional acts giving him authority to confiscate rebel property and forbidding the military from returning slaves of rebels to their owners. Abolitionists in the North criticized the president for limiting the scope of the edict to those states in rebellion, for it left open the question of how slaves and slave owners in the loyal, northern, states should be dealt with. Nevertheless, Lincoln had made a stand, which served to change the scope of the Civil War, 1861-65, to a war against slavery. On January 31, 1865, just over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, banning slavery throughout the United States. Lincoln, who had lobbied hard for this amendment, was pleased with its passage. The Confederate states did not free their four million slaves. Until after the Union was victorious, on April 9, 1865. Why did President Lincoln issue the Emancipation Proclamation before the end of the Civil War? As the war raged between the Confederacy and the Union, it looked like victory would be a long time in the making. In the summer of 1862 things seemed grim for the Federal troops when they were 
defeated at the Second Battle of Bull Run, which took place in northeastern Virginia on August 29-30. But on September 17, with the Battle of Antietam, in Maryland, the Union finally forced the Confederates to withdraw across the Potomac into Virginia. That September day was the bloodiest of the war. President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, decided that this withdrawal was success enough for him to make his proclamation. And on September 22, he called a cabinet meeting. That day he presented to his advisors the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The official Emancipation Proclamation was issued later. On January 1, 1863. This final version differed from the preliminary one in that it specified emancipation. Was to be effected only in those states that were in rebellion, i.e. the South. This key change had been made because the President's proclamation was based on congressional acts giving him authority to confiscate rebel property and forbidding the military from returning slaves of rebels to their owners. Abolitionists in the North criticized the President for limiting the scope of the edict to those states in rebellion for it left open the question of how slaves and slave owners in the loyal, northern, states should be dealt with. Nevertheless, Lincoln had made a stand, which served to change the scope of the Civil War, 1861-65, to a war against slavery. On January 31, 1865, just over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, banning slavery throughout the United States. Lincoln, who had lobbied hard for this amendment, was pleased with its passage. The Confederate States did not free their four million slaves. Until after the Union was victorious, on April 9, 1865. When was slavery outlawed in Europe? The slave trade ended in Britain in 1807, when authorities agreed with the growing number of abolitionists. Those who argued that slavery is immoral and violates Christian beliefs, and outlawed the trade. In 1833 slavery was abolished throughout the British colonies as the culmination of the great anti-slavery movement in Great Britain. In the United States, the slave trade was prohibited in 1808, but possessing slaves was still legal. Consequently, trade on the black market continued until Britain stepped up its enforcement of its anti-slavery law by conducting naval blockades and surprise raids off the African coast, effectively closing the trade. The slave trade as it had been known officially came to an end after 1870, when it was outlawed throughout the Americas. Throughout the world, the United Nations works to abolish slavery and other systems of forced labor. When was slavery outlawed in Europe? The slave trade ended in Britain in 1807, 
when authorities agreed with the growing number of abolitionists. Those who argued that slavery is immoral and violates Christian beliefs, and outlawed the trade. In 1833 slavery was abolished throughout the British colonies as the culmination of the great anti-slavery movement in Great Britain. In the United States, the slave trade was prohibited in 1808, but possessing slaves was still legal. Consequently, trade on the black market continued until Britain stepped up its enforcement of its anti-slavery law by conducting naval blockades and surprise raids off the African coast, effectively closing the trade. The slave trade as it had been known officially came to an end after 1870. When it was outlawed throughout the Americas. Throughout the world, the United Nations works to abolish slavery and other systems of forced labor. Is there slavery today? Yes, slavery continues into the 21st century. The United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, has stated. Although slavery has been formally abolished from the world, the trade in human misery continues. Today it is called human trafficking. Estimating the size of the problem is difficult. But the UNFPA estimates that about 4 million people are trafficked across international borders each year. The group also reports that the problem is widespread. But the greatest volume of human trafficking exists in Asia, with Africa and Latin America following close behind. The Asia-Pacific region is seen as particularly vulnerable. According to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNESCAP, because of its huge population pyramid, growing urbanization, and extensive poverty, some human rights groups estimate that the number of slaves in the world today is as high as 27 million people. And experts say that it is a growing problem, fueled by globalization. Men, women, and children, especially in developing countries, are forced into labor in sweatshops and fields, and into prostitution in brothels. In desperately poor regions of the world, Families sell their children into slave labor and forced prostitution. Other victims are lured in, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. From Himalayan villages to Eastern European cities, people especially women and girls are attracted by the prospect of a well-paid job as a domestic servant, waitress, or factory worker. Traffickers recruit victims through fake advertisements. Mail order bride catalogs, and casual acquaintances. But the victims end up in situations controlled by their traffickers. And they are exploited against their wills to earn illicit revenues. By the early 2000s, human rights groups and governments were organizing to combat the increase in human trafficking. Several agencies of the United Nations worked to address the roots of the problem and to aid victims.
non-government agencies were playing a role as well. One such group is Shared Hope International. Founded in 1998 by U.S. Congresswoman Linda Smith, Washington. To rescue and restore women and children in crisis by providing comprehensive services to meet their needs. Italy's government was at the forefront of the anti-trafficking movement. Offering residency permits to victims and funding local shelters through legislation passed. In 1999. In 2000 the U.S. Congress passed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. TVPA, declaring that sex trafficking is the modern-day slavery. Government figures estimated that each year 45,000 to 50,000 women and children were trafficked into the United States. Where they were trapped in modern day slavery like situations such as forced prostitution. But the trafficking problem in the United States, and elsewhere, is not limited to importing women and children from other countries. According to a September 2001 Justice Department report, 400. 000 children are lured or forced into prostitution each year in the United States. Many of the victims are from white, working and middle class families. Often runaways from troubled homes who end up on the streets. In September 2004 former representative John R. Miller, Washington was sworn into the newly created position of Ambassador at Large for the U.S. State Department's Anti-Trafficking Office. In a speech, Miller said, Today, the slavery is not on plantations and in homes. It is in factories and armies as well, and especially in brothels. But the slave masters use the same tools today as earlier slave masters, kidnapping, fraud, threats, and beatings, all aimed at forcing women, children, and men into labor and sex exploitation. Experts agreed that ending human trafficking in the 21st century would require a coalition of government. Special interest groups, human rights organizations, and other non-government organizations. Determining the scope of the problem and raising public awareness were important first steps. Is there slavery today? Yes, slavery continues into the 21st century. The United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, has stated. Although slavery has been formally abolished from the world, the trade in human misery continues. Today it is called human trafficking. Estimating the size of the problem is difficult. But the UNFPA estimates that about 4 million people are trafficked across international borders each year. The group also reports that the problem is widespread. But the greatest volume of human trafficking exists in Asia, with Africa and Latin America following close behind. The Asia-Pacific region is seen as particularly vulnerable. According to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNESCAP, because of its huge population pyramid, growing urbanization, and extensive poverty, some human rights groups estimate that the number of 
slaves in the world today is as high as 27 million people. And experts say that it is a growing problem, fueled by globalization. Men, women, and children, especially in developing countries, are forced into labor in sweatshops and fields, and into prostitution in brothels. In desperately poor regions of the world, families sell their children into slave labor and forced prostitution. Other victims are lured in, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. From Himalayan villages to Eastern European cities, people especially women and girls are attracted by the prospect of a well-paid job as a domestic servant, waitress, or factory worker. Traffickers recruit victims through fake advertisements. Mail order bride catalogs, and casual acquaintances. But the victims end up in situations controlled by their traffickers. And they are exploited against their wills to earn illicit revenues. By the early 2000s, human rights groups and governments were organizing to combat the increase in human trafficking. Several agencies of the United Nations work to address the roots of the problem and to aid victims. Non-government agencies were playing a role as well. One such group is Shared Hope International. Founded in 1998 by U.S. Congresswoman Linda Smith, Washington. To rescue and restore women and children in crisis by providing comprehensive services to meet their needs. Italy's government was at the forefront of the anti trafficking movement, offering residency permits to victims and funding local shelters through legislation passed. In 1999, in 2000 the U.S. Congress passed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act TVPA, declaring that sex trafficking is the modern-day slavery. Government figures estimated that each year 45,000 to 50,000 women and children were trafficked into the United States. Where they were trapped in modern day slavery like situations such as forced prostitution. But the trafficking problem in the United States, and elsewhere, is not limited to importing women and children from other countries. According to a September 2001 Justice Department report, 400. 000 children are lured or forced into prostitution each year in the United States. Many of the victims are from white, working and middle class families. Often runaways from troubled homes who end up on the streets. In September 2004 former representative John R. Miller, Washington was sworn into the newly created position of Ambassador at Large for the U.S. State Department's Anti-Trafficking Office. In a speech, Miller said, Today, the slavery is not on plantations and in homes. It is in factories and armies as well, and especially in brothels. But the slave masters use the same tools today as earlier slave masters, kidnapping, fraud, threats, and beatings, all aimed at forcing women, children, and men into labor and sex exploitation. Experts agreed that ending human trafficking in the 21st century would require a coalition of government. Special interest groups, human rights organizations, 
and other non-government organizations. Determining the scope of the problem and raising public awareness were important first steps. What was the Niagara Movement? It was a short-lived but important African-American organization that advocated the total integration of blacks into mainstream society. With all the rights, privileges, and benefits of other Americans. Founded in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in 1905, the Niagara Movement was led by writer, scholar, and activist W.E.B. Dubois. 1868-1963, who was then a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University. Observers described the organization as the anti-Bukharite camp, educator Booker T. Washington, 1856-1915, who rose from slavery to found Alabama's Tuskegee Institute. 1881, believed change for black people should be effected through education and self-improvement not through demand. Mr. Washington opposed the social and political agitation favored by some reformers. The Niagara Movement, on the other hand, placed the responsibility for the nation's racial problems squarely on the shoulders of its white population. The 30 branches of the Niagara movement challenged conservative politics of the so-called Tuskegee. Machine led by Booker T. Washington. Though the Niagara organization dissolved in 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP, was heir to its ideology and activism. Dubois helped found that organization, and from 1910 to 1934 edited its official journal, The Crisis, in which he published his views on nearly every important social issue that confronted the black community. What was the Niagara Movement? It was a short-lived but important African-American organization that advocated the total integration of blacks into mainstream society. With all the rights, privileges, and benefits of other Americans. Founded in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in 1905, the Niagara Movement was led by writer, scholar, and activist W.E.B. Dubois, 1868-1963, who was then a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University. Observers described the organization as the anti-Bukharite camp, educator Booker T. Washington, 1856 to 1915, who rose from slavery to found Alabama's Tuskegee Institute. 1881, believed change for black people should be effected through education and self-improvement not through demand. Mr. Washington opposed the social and political agitation favored by some reformers. The Niagara Movement, on the other hand, placed the responsibility for the nation's racial problems squarely on the shoulders of its white population. The 30 branches of the Niagara Movement challenged conservative politics of the so-called Tuskegee. Machine led by Booker T. Washington. Though the Niagara organization dissolved in 1909, the National 
Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, was heir to its ideology and activism. Dubois helped found that organization, and from 1910 to 1934 edited its official journal, The Crisis, in which he published his views on nearly every important social issue that confronted the black community. Were activists the only ones who were vocal about opposing segregation? No, segregation was opposed at every level of black society, as well as by many whites. The voices of the civil rights movement included wage laborers, farmers, educators, athletes. Entertainers, soldiers, religious leaders, politicians and statesmen all of whom had experienced the oppression of Jim Crow laws and policies in the United States before W.E.B. Du Bois. 1868-1963, rose to prominence as an educator and writer, he chose to leave the security of his home in Great Barrington. Massachusetts, to attend college at Nashville's Fisk University. There, in 1885, he encountered Tennessee's Jim Crow laws, which strictly divided blacks and whites. He was so intimidated by the Southern system that he rarely left the campus. And he ultimately returned to New England to complete his studies at Harvard University. He did, however, go back to the South. Becoming a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University, 1897-1910, 1932-44. As one of the first exponents of full and equal racial equality. In 1909 Dubois helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. NAACP, which provided leadership during the civil rights movement. In 1942 a young Georgia man named John Roosevelt Robinson, 1919-1972, was drafted into the military. Robinson applied for officers' candidate school at Fort Riley, Kansas. And although he was admitted to the program, he and the other black candidates received no training until pressure from Washington. D.C. forced the local commander to admit blacks to the base's training school. Later Robinson became a second lieutenant and continued to challenge the Jim Crow policies on military bases. When the Army decided to keep him out of a game with the nearby University of Missouri because that school refused to play against a team with black members, Robinson quit the base's football team in protest. At Fort Hood, Texas, Robinson objected to segregation on an Army bus. His protests led to court martial. Acquitted. In November 1944 Robinson was honorably discharged before the end of World War II. 1939-45 The Army had no desire to keep this black agitator among the ranks. And, as Robinson later put it, he was pretty much fed up with the service. In 1947 Jackie Robinson became the first black baseball player in the major leagues. When he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking the color barrier in the national pastime. In the post-war years, American diplomat Ralph Bunch, 1904-1971, attracted public attention when he rejected an offer from President Harry Truman, 
1884-1972, to become an Assistant Secretary of State. Bunch, a Howard University professor who had worked for the Office of Strategic Services during the war. Explained that he declined the position because he did not want to subject his family to the Jim Crow laws of Washington. D.C. Bunch spoke out frequently against racism. And in 1944 he co-authored the book An American Dilemma, which examined the plight of American blacks. These are just a few of the many examples of personal protest that signaled the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States. Were activists the only ones who were vocal about opposing segregation? No, segregation was opposed at every level of black society, as well as by many whites. The voices of the civil rights movement included wage laborers, farmers, educators, athletes, entertainers, soldiers, religious leaders, politicians, and statesmen all of whom had experienced the oppression of Jim Crow laws and policies in the United States. Before W.E.B. Du Bois 1868-1963, rose to prominence as an educator and writer, he chose to leave the security of his home in Great Barrington. Massachusetts, to attend college at Nashville's Fisk University. There, in 1885, he encountered Tennessee's Jim Crow laws, which strictly divided blacks and whites. He was so intimidated by the Southern system that he rarely left the campus. And he ultimately returned to New England to complete his studies at Harvard University. He did, however, go back to the South. Becoming a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University, 1897-1910, 1932-44. As one of the first exponents of full and equal racial equality. In 1909 Dubois helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. NAACP, which provided leadership during the civil rights movement. In 1942 a young Georgia man named John Roosevelt Robinson, 1919-1972, was drafted into the military. Robinson applied for officers candidate school at Fort Riley, Kansas. And although he was admitted to the program, he and the other black candidates received no training until pressure from Washington. D.C. forced the local commander to admit blacks to the base's training school. Later Robinson became a second lieutenant and continued to challenge the Jim Crow policies on military bases. When the Army decided to keep him out of a game with the nearby University of Missouri because that school refused to play against a team with black members, Robinson quit the base's football team in protest. At Fort Hood, Texas, Robinson objected to segregation on an Army bus. His protests led to court martial. Acquitted. In November 1944 Robinson was honorably discharged before the end of World War II. 1939-45 the army had no desire to keep this black agitator among the ranks. And, as Robinson later put it, he was pretty much fed up with the service. In 1947 Jackie Robinson became the first black baseball player in the major leagues. 
when he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking the color barrier in the national pastime. In the post-war years, American diplomat Ralph Bunch, 1904-1971, attracted public attention when he rejected an offer from President Harry Truman, 1884-1972, to become an Assistant Secretary of State. Bunch, a Howard University professor who had worked for the Office of Strategic Services during the war, explained that he declined the position because he did not want to subject his family to the Jim Crow laws of Washington. D.C. Bunch spoke out frequently against racism. And in 1944 he co-authored the book An American Dilemma, which examined the plight of American blacks. These are just a few of the many examples of personal protest that signaled the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States. Who was Emmett Till? Emmett Till, 1941-1955, was a black 14-year-old from Chicago who was brutally mutilated and killed in the Deep South in August 1955. The young man was visiting relatives in Mississippi when he allegedly whistled at a white female store clerk. Till was sharing a bed with his 12-year-old cousin when two white men came to get him on the morning of August 28, he was not seen alive again. His body was later found in a river, tied to a cotton gin fan with barbed wire. An all-white jury acquitted the store clerk's husband, Roy Bryant, and half-brother. J.W. Millman, of the crime. The events stirred anger in the black community and among civil rights proponents in general, setting off the civil rights movement. For four decades, Till's grisly murder continued to deeply trouble many, who believed justice could still be served. Though no one was ever convicted of the crime, and the two men who were tried for it had, by 2005, died, some of Till's family and friends, as well as investigators, believed others who participated in the lynching might still be alive. In a quest for clues, Till's body was disinterred in June 2005 to gather evidence. He was reburied in a quiet funeral. The Till family hoped the pending investigation would yield answers and justice. Who was Emmett Till? Emmett Till, 1941-1955, was a black 14-year-old from Chicago who was brutally mutilated and killed in the Deep South in August 1955. The young man was visiting relatives in Mississippi when he allegedly whistled at a white female store clerk. Till was sharing a bed with his 12-year-old cousin when two white men came to get him on the morning of August 28, he was not seen alive again. His body was later found in a river, tied to a cotton gin fan with barbed wire. An all-white jury acquitted the store clerk's husband, Roy Bryant, and half-brother. J.W. Millman, of the crime. The events stirred anger in the black community. 
and among civil rights proponents in general, setting off the civil rights movement. For four decades, Till's grisly murder continued to deeply trouble many who believed justice could still be served. Though no one was ever convicted of the crime, and the two men who were tried for it had by 2005, died, some of Till's family and friends. As well as investigators, believed others who participated in the lynching might still be alive. In a quest for clues, Till's body was disinterred in June 2005 to gather evidence. He was reburied in a quiet funeral. The Till family hoped the pending investigation would yield answers and justice. How did the civil rights movement begin? It began on Thursday, December 1, 1955, as Rosa Parks, 1913. A seamstress who worked for a downtown department store in Montgomery, Alabama, made her way home on the Cleveland Avenue bus. Parks was seated in the first row that was designated for blacks. But the white rows in the front of the bus soon filled up. When Parks was asked to give up her seat so that a white man could sit. She refused. She was arrested and sent to jail. Montgomery's black leaders had already been discussing staging a protest against racial segregation on the city buses. They soon organized, with Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr. 1929-1968, as their leader. Beginning on December 5, 1955, thousands of black people refused to ride the city buses, the Montgomery bus boycott had begun. It lasted more than a year 382 days and ended only when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional. The protesters and civil rights activists had emerged the victors in this there. First and momentous effort to end segregation and discrimination in the United States. Parks, who lost her job as a result of the arrest, later explained that she had acted on her own beliefs that she was being unfairly treated. But in so doing, Parks had taken a stand and had given rise to a movement. How did the civil rights movement begin? It began on Thursday, December 1, 1955, as Rosa Parks, 1913. A seamstress who worked for a downtown department store in Montgomery, Alabama, made her way home on the Cleveland Avenue bus. Parks was seated in the first row that was designated for blacks. But the white rows in the front of the bus soon filled up. When Parks was asked to give up her seat so that a white man could sit. She refused. She was arrested and sent to jail. Montgomery's black leaders had already been discussing staging a protest against racial segregation on the city buses. They soon organized, with Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr. 
1929-1968, as their leader. Beginning on December 5, 1955, thousands of black people refused to ride the city buses, the Montgomery bus boycott had begun. It lasted more than a year 382 days and ended only when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional. The protesters and civil rights activists had emerged the victors in this their first and momentous effort to end segregation and discrimination in the United States. Parks, who lost her job as a result of the arrest. Later explained that she had acted on her own beliefs that she was being unfairly treated. But in so doing Parks had taken a stand and had given rise to a movement. When was paper money first used? Paper money first appeared in China during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. In the 9th century AD, paper notes were used by Chinese merchants as certificates of exchange and later, for paying taxes to the government. It was not until the 11th century, also in China, that the notes were backed by deposits of silver and gold, called hard money. What is the Federal Reserve? It is the central banking system in the United States, created by a 1913 Act of Congress. The Federal Reserve Act, sometimes called the Glass-Owens Bill. The legislation provided for a stable central banking system after the system set up. By the National Bank Act of 1863 proved ineffective in managing the nation's currency. In responding to economic growth, or in exerting a controlling influence on the economy. The Federal Reserve Act created 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, in Boston, Massachusetts. New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, St. Louis, Missouri. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Kansas City, Missouri, Dallas, Texas, and San Francisco, California. These institutions operate as bankers' banks, member banks, commercial institutions. Use their accounts with the Federal Reserve in the same way that consumers use their accounts on deposit at commercial banks. All national banks must be members of the Federal Reserve System. State banks may join the system upon meeting certain requirements. The Federal Reserve Act also established a Federal Reserve Board. Now called the Board of Governors, to supervise the system. The board consists of seven members who are appointed by the President of the United States and are approved by the Senate. To reduce the possibility of nearsighted political influence. Members serve staggered 14-year terms, one of the 14 terms expires every other year. The duties of the Federal Reserve include lending money to commercial, member, banks. 
directing the Reserve Bank's purchase and sale of U.S. government securities on the open market. Setting Reserve Requirements, for how much money needs to be in the U.S. Treasury. And regulating the discount rate, the interest rate the Federal Reserve charges commercial banks for loans. Which is one of the system's principal influences on the economy. In performing these duties, the Federal Reserve, often called the Fed in financial circles, can expand, loosen, or contract, tighten, the supply of money in circulation. The Federal Reserve also issues the national currency and supervises and regulates the activities of banks and their holding companies. It began operation in November 1914. The central bank systems of other developed nations include the Bank of Canada, Banque de France, and the Deutsche Bundesbank, of Germany. Why was the introduction of plastic important to industry? Pioneered in the early 1900s, plastic which is any synthetic organic material that can be molded under heat and pressure to retain a shape affected every industry and every consumer. As a malleable material, plastic could quite literally be molded for countless uses. Both for the production of goods and as a material in finished goods. In 1909 Bakelite plastic was introduced, and over the next three decades the plastics industry grew. Developing acrylic, nylon, polystyrene and vinyl, polyvinyl chloride or PVC, in the 1930s, and polyesters in the 1940s. The application seemed endless, from household items such as hosiery, clocks, radios, toys, flooring, food containers, bags, electric plugs, and garden hoses. To commercial uses such as automobile bodies and parts, airplane windows, boat hulls, packaging, and building materials. The space industry and medicine have also found critical uses for plastic products. Scientists have continued to find new applications for plastics in products such as compact discs. CDs, computer diskettes, outdoor furniture, and personal computers, PCs. The material has become essential to modern life. When did the anti-slavery movement begin? In the United States, the campaign to prohibit slavery strengthened in the early 1800s. Across the Atlantic, abolitionists had successfully lobbied for the outlaw of slave trade in Great Britain by 1807. The following year, the U.S. government also outlawed the trade, but possession of slaves remained legal and profitable. In the 1830s the call to abolish slavery and emancipate slaves became an active movement in the United States. Precipitated by a revival of evangelical religion in the North. Abolitionists, believing slavery is morally wrong and violates Christian beliefs. Called for an end to the system, which had become critical to the agrarian economy of the southern states. 
where plantations produced cotton, tobacco, and other crops for domestic and international markets. What was the 1990s boom? It was the longest economic expansion in American history. According to accepted economic indicators, the boom began in March 1991, when the first President Bush was in office. And ended in March 2001. When President George W. Bush was in office. Eight years of the expansion were during the Clinton administration. The hallmarks of the 1990s boom were the creation of almost 24 million jobs. Or an average of 200,000 jobs a month a national unemployment rate that dropped to around 4% for an extended period. Productivity gains month over month, gross domestic product, GDP, growth month over month. Unprecedented investment in the stock market, Wall Street added $10 trillion in wealth over the decade. A bull market fueled by $100 billion in initial public offerings, IPOs, many of them technology stocks. Low interest rates, a low inflation rate averaging 2.6% per year, the elimination of the federal budget deficit. And the addition of dollars to the paychecks of many American workers. The last time the economy had seen similar indicators was during the 1960s. But in January 2000 the boom surpassed all others to become the longest sustained. Expansion in U.S. History Economists considered the factors that contributed to the boom. A Christian Science Monitor writer credited a combination of ubiquitous American entrepreneurial spirit. Massive amounts of technology, and a man named Greenspan. But Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, which controls interest rates, credited information technology as the defining factor of this special period. Its major contribution is to reduce the number of worker hours required to produce the nation's output, said Greenspan. The boom ended in March 2001, along with the end of the dot-com bubble. The nation began a short recession, which ended November 2001, according to economic indicators. The economy then began a slow, and by most indicators, weak recovery. How did the civil rights movement begin? It began on Thursday, December 1, 1955, as Rosa Parks, 1913. A seamstress who worked for a downtown department store in Montgomery, Alabama, made her way home on the Cleveland Avenue bus. Parks was seated in the first row that was designated for blacks. But the white rows in the front of the bus soon filled up. When Parks was asked to give up her seat so that a white man could sit. She refused. She was arrested and sent to jail. Montgomery's black leaders had already been discussing staging a protest against racial segregation on the city buses. They soon organized, with Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr. 1929 to 1968, as their leader. 
beginning on December 5, 1955, thousands of black people refused to ride the city buses, the Montgomery bus boycott had begun. It lasted more than a year 382 days and ended only when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional. The protesters and civil rights activists had emerged the victors in this their first and momentous effort to end segregation and discrimination in the United States. Parks, who lost her job as a result of the arrest. Later explained that she had acted on her own beliefs that she was being unfairly treated. But in so doing Parks had taken a stand and had given rise to a movement. Why did President Lincoln issue the Emancipation Proclamation before the end of the Civil War? As the war raged between the Confederacy and the Union, it looked like victory would be a long time in the making. In the summer of 1862 things seemed grim for the Federal troops when they were defeated at the Second Battle of Bull Run, which took place in northeastern Virginia on August 29-30. But on September 17, with the Battle of Antietam, in Maryland, the Union finally forced the Confederates to withdraw across the Potomac into Virginia. That September day was the bloodiest of the war. President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, decided that this withdrawal was success enough for him to make his proclamation. And on September 22, he called a cabinet meeting. That day he presented to his advisors the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The official Emancipation Proclamation was issued later. On January 1, 1863. This final version differed from the preliminary one in that it specified emancipation was to be effected only in those states that were in rebellion, i.e. the South. This key change had been made because the President's proclamation was based on congressional acts giving him authority to confiscate rebel property and forbidding the military from returning slaves of rebels to their owners. Abolitionists in the North criticized the president for limiting the scope of the edict to those states in rebellion, for it left open the question of how slaves and slave owners in the loyal, northern, states should be dealt with. Nevertheless. Lincoln had made a stand, which served to change the scope of the Civil War, 1861-65, to a war against slavery. On January 31, 1865, just over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, banning slavery throughout the United States. Lincoln, who had lobbied hard for this amendment, was pleased with its passage. The Confederate states did not free their four million slaves. Until after the Union was victorious, on April 9, 1865. When was slavery outlawed in Europe?
The slave trade ended in Britain in 1807, when authorities agreed with the growing number of abolitionists. Those who argued that slavery is immoral and violates Christian beliefs, and outlawed the trade. In 1833 slavery was abolished throughout the British colonies as the culmination of the great anti-slavery movement in Great Britain. In the United States, the slave trade was prohibited in 1808, but possessing slaves was still legal. Consequently, trade on the black market continued until Britain stepped up its enforcement of its anti-slavery law by conducting naval blockades and surprise raids off the African coast, effectively closing the trade. The slave trade as it had been known officially came to an end after 1870, when it was outlawed throughout the Americas. Throughout the world, the United Nations works to abolish slavery and other systems of forced labor. When was money introduced? The use of money dates back some 4,000 years, when people began using something of recognized value. Such as precious metals including gold and silver, to purchase goods and services. In the absence of money, all transactions were made on the barter system, which is an exchange of goods and services negotiated by the parties involved. The introduction of money simplified the acquisition of products and services. The ancient country of Lydia, in the western part of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, is credited with the first use of standardized coins, made of gold and silver, in the 7th century BC. Who was Emmett Till? Emmett Till, 1941-1955, was a black 14-year-old from Chicago who was brutally mutilated and killed in the Deep South in August 1955. The young man was visiting relatives in Mississippi when he allegedly whistled at a white female store clerk. Till was sharing a bed with his 12-year-old cousin when two white men came to get him on the morning of August 28, he was not seen alive again. His body was later found in a river, tied to a cotton gin fan with barbed wire. An all-white jury acquitted the store clerk's husband, Roy Bryant, and half-brother, J.W. Millman, of the crime. The events stirred anger in the black community. And among civil rights proponents in general, setting off the civil rights movement. For four decades, Till's grisly murder continued to deeply trouble many who believed justice could still be served. Though no one was ever convicted of the crime, and the two men who were tried for it had by 2005, died, some of Till's family and friends, as well as investigators, believed others who participated in the lynching might still be alive. In a quest for clues, Till's body was disinterred in June 2005 to gather evidence. He was reburied in a quiet funeral. The Till family hoped the pending investigation would yield answers and justice.
What were continentals? Continentals were the paper money issued by the U.S. government during the American Revolution, 1775 to 83. The Second Continental Congress, which governed the new nation after the Declaration of Independence. 1776, ran the war effort against Great Britain. The governing body did not have the power to levy taxes, since no constitution had been drawn up yet. So the Congress appealed to each state to contribute to the war fund. However, states that did not face imminent danger those in which there was no fighting often did not answer the call. Many of the new nation's most prominent citizens remained loyal to the British and refused to contribute money to the American patriotic cause. Yet money was needed to buy supplies and ammunition, and to pay soldiers. In order to finance the revolution, Congress was compelled to issue paper bills, which promised holders future payment in silver. But as Congress issued more and more continentals, the currency became devalued because there was not enough silver to back up the promised payments. By 1780 there were so many continentals in circulation that they had become almost worthless. The phrase not worth a continental was used by Americans to describe anything that had no value. To help solve the financial crisis, some patriotic citizens contributed sums of money. In exchange, they received interest-bearing securities from the government. But funds continued to be scarce. The problem of funding the revolutionary effort was not solved until foreign powers stepped in to aid the fledgling nation in its fight against the powerful British. European loans to the United States, notably from France, were instrumental in the American victory in the Revolutionary War.